Our next developmental stage is the period of adolescence. So this is a period of development and transition from childhood into adulthood. Now this is one of those places where um, that exact hard line between childhood and adulthood can depend dramatically on where in the world you are, on your community, on your culture. All of these things can have an effect on when one is considered an adult or an adolescent or a child. So some cultures will have a rite of passage, a ceremony or an event that marks that transition. So maybe you have a celebration that marks the time when you are now an adult. Um, and so even though most cultures will recognize an official transition between childhood and adulthood, not all of them have this period analogous with adolescence. So some go straight from childhood to adulthood with less time in this between state. But again, as I've mentioned many times in this course, we are fairly North American centric where we have a prolonged period of adolescence. While we are teenagers, we are neither children nor adults and we're somewhere in the middle. And so it's important to note here that adolescence is not the same thing as puberty. Puberty is something that is biologically defined, and it's a period of physical maturation when we reach sexual maturity. Adolescence can include puberty, but it isn't puberty alone. So it also includes changes in thinking and interests and so social circumstances and expectations. So there's a lot of other factors going on as well. Um, so just a little bit of a preamble for talking about adolescence. And you'll find that once again, we're covering these topics fairly briefly because Again, we're talking about the entirety of human development in uh, a single chapter, so we can't go into tons of detail on everything. But our first stage is to talk about cognitive and brain development. So one of the biggest things when we think of coming into adolescence, as we move into our teenage years, right before we're adults, there's a lot of issues with things like decision making and risk taking. I can also remind us that this is when we would pass into that formal operational stage from Piaget's stages, and we could start uh, thinking of hypothetical events. That's that final stage that would carry over here. Um, so as our brains become more developed, as we get into that almost adult stage, we start having more executive functions, we have a more reliable working memory, we're really good at task switching, and we start developing the ability to inhibit impulses. But adolescents think a lot differently than children do, and they also think a lot differently than adults do. And there's a couple of differences for this. One that we can talk about directly is the development of our prefrontal cortex. So the front part of our brain is a part of us that is very responsible for decision making, for evaluating and considering consequences. And that part of the brain isn't fully developed until we're in our mid-20s. So a lot of adolescent impulsiveness could be pointed at this uh, not fully developed prefrontal cortex. And if we look at imaging studies of human brains, we find that the brains of adolescents look a lot different from those of older adults when they're considering the outcomes or the consequences of events. And this difference is a lot more uh, noticeable or a lot more apparent, especially if something is high risk. So adolescents don't have the ability to inhibit that urge to do something that's high risk. They don't realize sort of the magnitude of the situation, whereas older adults will have better consideration. And to have a specific slide on risk taking, we can talk about the white matter in our frontal cortex or prefrontal cortex. Um, so that's where we're starting to see more white matter. That means more axons, myelinated axons, if you remember back to 104. Um, so that's where the parts of our brain that make connections with other neurons, they're all gonna group together. 
So having more white matter means we're having more connections between our neurons. So we're getting uh, better connections and those connections might allow us to uh, control impulses and think about things more abstractly. So if those areas haven't completely developed, if they're not fully formed, then maybe we're not making a lot of connections. Maybe we're not able to inhibit impulses, those sort of gut responses that we want to have. So um, where we're sort of trying to get to the point where we have lots of white matter, lots of those connections between our neurons as we get older, when we are younger at sort of 11 or 12 years of age, we have a lot of non-myelinated gray matter in that frontal cortex. So at this age, that 11 to 12 years of age, we have more gray matter in that area than we do when we're older. So eventually we develop more and more white matter and that's associated with these things, having that development in that prefrontal cortex, and having better control of our executive functions, again, working memory, switching between tasks, and inhibiting impulsive behavior, um, before we get to that point, we're not very good at all of those things. So that's the uh, brain side of things. What about our social development? Um, we can look at adolescent egocentrism. And this is the second time we're seeing this word in this chapter. Egocentrism. We talked about it in children, where they thought that everyone has the same amount of knowledge that they do. In adolescence, this self-centering takes on some slightly different perspectives. So adolescents display a self-absorbed and distorted view of their own uniqueness and importance in the world. So we have this overestimation of the uniqueness of our feelings and our experiences. So we can call this the personal fable. So adolescents think that they're not vulnerable to risky situations, that they are the only one who could do this. I am special. We also have oversensitivity to social evaluation. And the technical term for that is an imaginary audience. When we have those feelings that everyone is going to know what I'm doing, everyone is watching me, that would be that imaginary audience. And this seems to be consistent across all uh, adolescents in lots of different cultures. So it might have something to do with that developing prefrontal cortex, but everyone feels like they are special and alone and constantly being watched, which is one of the worst parts of adolescence. Um, and it seems to be a little bit biological, but has a massive uh, impact on our social development as well. Another important part of that uh, social development would also be leading us into identity development. And so this is the idea that we have um, sort of our individual identity, our individual... I actually had to pause and look up a synonym for identity because my brain just didn't help me out there. Um, but sort of a feeling of self, how they would identify themselves. And so we can look at four identity statuses that vary based on individual exploration and commitment. So these come from James uh, Marcia back in the 1980s, and he focused on whether we were high exploration on this side or low exploration, low commitment or high commitment. We can start with individuals who have foreclosed identity. These are those who prematurely decided who they are, what they identify as, what their individual uh, identity is, and they're basically just going to conform to the ideas or the expectations set by others. They didn't do a lot of self-exploration, and they committed to it already, so they set themselves, they closed in on that identity that's sort of the default from others' expectations. Those with identity diffusion, they may have not actually made any decisions or commitments about their identity. They're low commitment, so they haven't settled on anything, but they aren't actively seeking an identity either. So they're sort of in that in-between state. Those in the psychosocial moratorium, 
Those are people who are actively exploring lots of different options. They haven't settled on an identity yet, but they're actively looking and exploring what fits best for them. And then the last is the identity achievement, where they did a lot of exploring and they've settled on the thing that fits best for them. So uh, by Marcia's uh, dis uh, determination here, this would be the ideal or the best option for us to have. 